All right. How's everyone doing today? I, I am thrilled about uh, today's uh, live stream. We have the opportunity today to talk to uh, two personnel. Uh, we've got Captain Holly Weaver from the Kansas City Medical Recruiting Station based out of uh, Kansas City. She falls under the 5th Medical Recruiting Battalion. And we've also got the Surgeon General of the United States Army, Lieutenant Scott Dingle. So, I hope that you all enjoy today's live stream discussion. Um, I think it's gonna be a really entertaining and a really informative one. So uh, get ready for some good information. And here we go. Let's go ahead and play that um, commercial first. And here we go. And here we go. All right, awesome. And before we get a chance, well, we've got everyone here on board. Uh, we will get a chance to, let's first talk with Captain Holly Weaver. Uh, Captain Weaver, I know you're here to talk to us about uh, opportunities that folks may have regarding Army medicine and Army medical careers. Can you share with us all this good information that you've got for us? Absolutely. First, I want to say thank you so much, Otis, for having me again. It's always a pleasure doing these live stream interviews with you. We've been able to cover so many um, different great career options and mm -hmm. different opportunities within Army Medicine the last couple of months. And um, my name is Captain Holly Weaver, and I am an Army nurse. I have the amazing opportunity to help medical professionals take the next step in their career and um, answer their call to serve our nation mm -hmm. as an army medical professional. 10 years ago, I was sitting in nursing school when my army recruiter came and shared his story and all of the amazing opportunities as an army nurse. I was intrigued to find out more. And I tell you what, Otis, I'm so glad I did because there has not been one day since that moment that I've regretted becoming an army nurse and an army officer. Mm -hmm. So now, um, a decade later, I have this great opportunity to help others. And we have uh, so many different career options and um, options to pay for your medical school, CRNA school, to help out with um, your student loans, uh, bonus opportunities. The options are almost limitless. Yeah. So if you find yourself interested in either a part-time opportunity in the Army Reserve or full-time opportunity in the Army, feel free to contact me. One of the ways below on my Instagram, the Army Nurse, Hello. you can click on um, the link right in my bio and it'll take you to our page that has information on all the different careers. Mm -hmm. If you're not located in my area, which is the Midwest, I'll get you to the right recruiter and we'll find out what program will be right for you. So we just have so many different options and it truly has been a blessing and an honor to serve our country. And I'm just so thankful that my army recruiter came into my classroom 10 years ago, and now here I am doing the same thing for others. That's awesome, that's awesome. You know, Holly, I really had a great time the past uh, couple months doing these live streams with you. I think it's, you know, you're a great service to our country. I really appreciate the opportunity to just talk and share and, you know, educate others on the many opportunities that's out there for army, medical, army medicine, army medical careers. I've got to say, you know, I want to reiterate what you said. Hey, we have uh, some links on our social media pages. So we have a push right now for Army careers, and we're hiring medical personnel to include, you know, officers from anesthesiologists all the way down to urologists. So it's a wide range of Army medical careers, medical opportunities. 
scholarship opportunities. And if you're looking for information regarding that and you want to serve our nation, go ahead and check out our social media pages, the Army Nurses page. You see the ticker on the bottom. You see the information out there. So come on out, look for those opportunities. It's there for you. You've always answered the call and we're trying to make you answer your, um, your call, all right? So what's your warrior? What's your opportunity? It's there for you. I'm looking forward to it and just awesome, awesome, awesome opportunity. So I know Holly, today we have the distinguished opportunity to interview the uh, the man, the myth, the legend, you will say, um, Lieutenant General Scott Dingle. And I wanna just say, I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm so excited. This is such an honor and an amazing opportunity for the both of us, as mm -hmm. well as, you know, Army medicine, the Army as a whole, you know, perspective, future soldiers currently serving, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to have this opportunity that the Surgeon General is taking time out of his day to mm -hmm. talk with us and engage with everyone out there virtually. I mean, it's it's truly amazing. And I feel extremely humbled that we both have this opportunity to do that. Awesome. So let's go ahead and add him on the live stream. I'll go ahead and clear you out first real fast. And then we will add on, and here he is, Lieutenant General Scott Dingle. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Can you hear me, Otis and Holly? Sure can, sir. We hear you perfectly, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. And I tell you, I'm humbled with the opportunity just to listen to you two and to share our story in Army Medicine. Cool, awesome, sir. Awesome. <laughs> you know, this is our second time uh, getting a chance to, uh, you know, chat at least via video. The first time we knocked it out, the second time it's going to be even better. Don't you say, sir? Oh, absolutely. 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 Sir, you know, I want to say, first of all, thank you from the 5th Medical Recruiting Battalion. You taking the time to come and talk with us. You know, we, uh, we had a chance to kind of go over the things that uh, we'd like to share during our discussion. Uh, things ranging from hearing your army story, your call to serve, and also, you know, there's social issues going on right now within the United States of America. And we're definitely looking forward to hearing your points of views during this discussion, sir. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. So, sir, the first thing, first batter up, first question, we'd like to know, and we'd like to have you share with the viewers, the many viewers on our discussion, sir, can you share with us your army story? my army story well I, I don't have a conventional army story that i grew up you know um, wanting to come into the military i did not go to a military academy my mm -hmm. army story was kind of unique because um, i did not want to come into the military as i was growing up uh, my father i grew up in a military family so i was familiar with the military my dad was air force enlisted mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in uh, Maryland. I'm from Upper Marlboro, Maryland, Prince George's County. And as I grew up, my dad did 20 years in the Air Force. However, uh, the majority of, of my life was, uh, was raised right in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area in Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. We came to the DC area uh, as my dad got stationed at Bowling Air Force Base. Uh, so we lived in Southeast Washington, DC, and then we moved out to Maryland. He retired mm -hmm. and I grew up. And so I didn't do a lot of, of, of traveling around the world as a military family. I literally grew up right here. And so with that, I had no desire because my dad would talk about the military and me coming up, I was an athlete. You know, I was a football and track athlete growing up. And, mm -hmm. you know, my dad would talk about and want me to go to a military academy and he's from New York and he was always motivated about West Point. And so mm -hmm. if an athlete, you know, he was like, okay, you're going to go to military academy, go to a military academy. And I'd be like, dad, I am not going in the military. <laughs> I'm not wearing no uniform. I am not mm -hmm. standing in lines. You know, I'm not doing it. And mm -hmm. as I, you know, went through high school, you know, I was heavily recruited coming out of high school as a football and track athlete, I ended up going to Morgan State University. Um, it, it was, it was, um, a tremendous experience, but I had to make a deal with my dad in order for me to go to Morgan because he wanted me to go to West Point, VMI, and a few of the other schools that were recruiting me that were military mm -hmm. based. And I, I made a deal with him. I said, Dad, you know, again, now you got to remember this is the 80s. And so uh, some of those schools like VMI were still, you know, uh, single, all male, you know, mm -hmm. and not co ed. 
And so as I made a deal with my dad, I said, look, I, I promise you that I will take ROTC as long as you allow me to go to school uh, of my choice. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, played football, ran track uh, at Morgan, and I took ROTC. Now, again, I was not the normal cadet going through ROTC because I said, well, I'm just doing this for dad. I'm going to check the block, you know, get a commission uh, and go in the Army Reserves as if I go off to play, you know, professional football. Mm -hmm. And as I was matriculating um, through college, you know, life happens, you know, and as life yes. happens, my dad is like, <clears throat> you know, you got to grow up quick. You know, you playing in the NFL mm -hmm. is not going to put money on the table for you and your family. And so <clears throat> I went to basic camp and that was my first introduction of what the Army really was. ROTC gave me a, you know, a slight uh, familiarization. But when I went to basic camp in Fort Knox, Kentucky, um, I loved it. It was the first time that I was really exposed to what the Army really uh, was about with cadets from across the nation. And it was like a big team. Me being an athlete and a college athlete, um, it, it just reminded me of being a part of a team, being part of a family. And having growing up, always being the captain of the team, um, mm -hmm. playing sports, um, I graduated at the top of basic camp um, at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I was bitten by the bug. Wow. Because then I realized that the Army was about teamwork. And I said, man, this was okay. You know, before that, I was probably at the bottom of the barrel of my ROTC class because I never came to class because I was always at practice. And then when I came, yeah. I was not familiar with all the drill and ceremonies. But going mm -hmm. to Fort Knox for basic camp uh, blew me away. Graduated top of the class, as I said came back uh you know playing football then went to advanced camp did they had a great time in advanced camp graduating at the top uh distinguished mm -hmm. military graduate from morgan state university my plan wow. still was not to come into the army but it was to you know trial for a professional football team and if i didn't make it i was gonna go to law school and then stay in baltimore and practice law well at the same time you know again i had to make some decisions as you know um i had my daughter uh, right at the end of my college, uh, my senior year, going into my senior year, my wife had already graduated and um, I had to fall back on something that was going to give me a foundation. And at that point, I knew as a profession that the military offered any career field that I wanted to go into and I'd be able to branch off of. And so as I wow. made that choice to say, you know what, I'm going to go active duty, not reserves, um, I left uh, Morgan State a year early, didn't even play my last year of football. I just left and uh, came in the Army. And then um, the rest is is history. Um, I yeah. was branch Medical Service Corps. Initially, I was going military police in the reserves. When I switched to active duty, I branched Medical Service Corps. And mm -hmm. from the very first assignment, it just revalidated what basic camp and advanced camp taught me about the military. That is a profession of arms that allows you to live any dream that you want. And it mm. truly has allowed me to live my dreams. Throughout my mm -hmm. military career as a medical service corps officer, um, I've commanded at every level. But the one thing that really um, drives me about the military that sold me was the family, the teamwork, the profession mm -hmm. of arms, the ability to achieve your goals because the opportunities are there. And then it is just a a fantastic, fabulous foundation that allowed mm -hmm. me to build and live all of my dreams. And thus, here I am, you know, now as um, the Surgeon General of the United States Army. Um, it wasn't my plan because my plan was um, I enjoyed building teams. I loved the medical field. I loved working in um, field hospital units and medical treatment facilities and on medical staffs, um, mm -hmm. taking care of the soldiers, the family members, the beneficiary population. And when you love your job, when you enjoy what you do, um, it's not a job, but it's a joy. Because yes. you're now excelling at a level because you love what you do. And I truly love what I do as a United States Army officer. Wow, wow, excellent. You know, sir, it seems like uh, to use your football background, I, I wanna try to make a metaphor. You kind of ran all the way to the end zone with that touchdown. You were given that initial foundation. You were given that 
you know, that tuck and run and you took it all the way to the end. And it's something that I think should be celebrated. Absolutely. You know, sir, I know Holly has a question regarding uh, Army medicine and the COVID-19 response as far as what the Army's uh, role is. So, Holly, do you want to go ahead? And, and Holly, before you ask that question, but, you know, Otis, as uh -huh. as, as the many uh, potential recruits and soldiers that are out there and even civilians mm -hmm. that are listening, um, as using your metaphor, as you are running down the career field of your life, you have to make sure that you are listening to the audibles. Oh, you yeah. got to know the plays that are being run because every play, every down is something different as you make the choices in your life, mm -hmm. whether professional or personal. But one of the key pieces is you got to listen to the audible when life switches up on you so that you can score to live your dreams. All right, sure. Excellent, excellent. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, sir. That was really, really insightful and mm -hmm. we can just learn so much from you. So my question for you, sir, is, you know, if you could just kind of tell our viewers, you know, what Army Medicine has been doing. We have been in the forefront with COVID-19. I know we've been doing a lot with vaccinations, providing support, you know, at different locations throughout the United States. And I know we have been just doing a phenomenal job. And I, you know, I would just like for you to share, you know, kind of high level overview of what we've been doing to get after it and to help support our nation as we fight this fight. That's, that's you know, there, there's a saying that says many are called, few are chosen. But those that answer the call or choose to answer the call for military service in our country is, is 1% of our nation. But mm -hmm. those that wear the cloth of the profession of arms are a very special bunch. And so the Army's mission, you know, to be ready when called upon to protect our nation, you know, you saw our country saw this in full exposure as this pandemic hit our nation. And as the pandemic hit our coast, you know, it wasn't a splash, but it was a tsunami that basically has just gone across from, from west to east, north to south. It doesn't make a difference. But the key thing about it is the Army's response, ready, mm -hmm. readiness. Well, readiness to what? We say in, in Army medicine to conserve the fighting strength, to save lives when called upon on the battlefield. Well, in this case here, the pandemic is our battlefield. And what you saw in the Army's response and Army Medicine's response was the call to conserve the strength of our citizens, of our mm -hmm. mothers, our fathers, our children, our grandparents. You know, as we struggled with this, it was just a tremendous blessing that the United States military, the Army was called upon to get involved. And what you saw was the, the, the combat support hospital, the field hospitals, the hospital centers, to engage and to do a mission that, you know, again, we, we weren't prepared for because this is a, a black swan event in the history of our nation and our lives that has never happened before. And so as we responded to it, you saw the military army medicine adapt into this environment, deploying to New York City, to Washington State. And then you saw what we call urban augmentation medical task force. Those are 85 member teams of, of medical professionals who basically assembled to answer the call to the states across the country. Yeah. And as we landed in the states across the country, you saw that Army Medicine did not just stay as a unit together, they separated and embedded themselves in our mm -hmm. city, in our towns, in our hospitals to support and conserve the lives of the American citizens. And if you could have just interviewed, and if you watched the interview of the soldiers and, and those service members that were on these teams, you can hear the pride. You can hear the honor of them wanting to, to save lives in our mm -hmm. very young country. A phenomenal, phenomenal um, display of Army medicine. But in addition, what you don't see behind the scenes is that at the highest levels in support of the whole of government approach, you have army officers and army soldiers that are embedded in everything from the White House task force to Operation Warp Speed, to the Joint Staff, to Health and Human Services, to FEMA. And as the army officers are called upon to embed, they are playing key roles as a team. Remember that teamwork concept you know, is so strong. And as they embedded with our team of our government, of our nation, of our of our lettered agencies, whether FEMA, whether HHS, 
but the army officers are there and they are leading and supporting like no other. For instance, the you, many of you may have heard and seen about the community-based testing task force that are mm -hmm. spreading across our country, for over 400 of these test sites that are popping up to support our citizens. Well, you had an army officer that was one of the lead concept developers helping and assisting in that concept. Whether mm -hmm. if it's the HHS operations or FEMA operations, they're embedded tremendously. The other thing that is unique about the Army and serving as a healthcare worker or a professional in the Army is that you're doing it in the military treatment facilities. Mm -hmm. But when you called upon, like in this pandemic of COVID, you know, we deployed over 415 of healthcare professionals, of our doctors, and those pre those key critical specialties that are in the emergency rooms and in the wards and mm -hmm. intensive care, they deployed with our deployable hospital units to provide this support embedded um, across the nation. But also what you don't see is that as they deployed out, we had over 165 retiree recalls. Those are officers and, and, and leaders and soldiers who served their country for their 30 years retired are now in retirement mode but yet when they saw this pandemic in the army responding they're saying here i am send me and answer the call and backfield where we pulled from our medical treatment facilities we had 165 plus and numbers still growing of retirees to sign up and to get back on the team that is that passion to serve the country the passion to serve um, your brother and your sister in arms, the passion to answer the call to our nation. It is a noble cause. You know, General Douglas MacArthur said, duty on a country, what we will be, you know, what you ought to be, what you shall be, what we as a country, we as Army Medicine live every day. And as you can see, or I know you tell, I get excited about it. You know, <laughs> not just a, the tip of the sword. There, there is over uh, 76,000 Army Medicine um, soldiers, civilians, and personnel behind me that are even just as excited as me to serve mm -hmm. our country and to do our jobs. Awesome, awesome. Sir, so I get a chance to actually see some of the comments that's coming into our discussion. So I'm going to bring up some of the comments, maybe a personnel that you know, maybe personnel that Captain Weaver knows. So let's go ahead and show them up on the screen. So we've got one from uh, Mr. Clifford Lovett. He said, good afternoon from this retired AMED Medac Sergeant Major. How are you doing, Sergeant Major? Thank you for your comments. Do you do you by chance know uh, Mr. Lovett, uh, Captain Weaver? I do. I worked with him at Munson Army Health Center. He's the group practice manager on primary care when I was the clinical nurse officer in charge and the company commander over there. So he is um, like a mentor and just an all around good person and a wealth of knowledge and history of army medicine for sure. Awesome, awesome. So we've got some folks that Captain Weaver may have helped uh, to join the service as well. We've got one from uh, Andrea Nicodem. I said, good afternoon, ma'am. Captain Weaver just helped me get approved to sit for the army nurse board. That's, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. One of my recruits one. getting ready to uh, go to the board and hopefully, um, you know, get selected and get ready to awesome. serve. Awesome. You've got another one from Lacey Elwood. Captain Weaver has been my recruiter and I'm now part of the nurse course. Super proud to know her. That's excellent. That's excellent. Oh, we've got one for Major, we got one for Lieutenant General Dingle. It says a Lieutenant General Dingle is a ph phenomenal mentor and friend. Honored to know him and his lovely wife, Sonia, from Veranda Brooks Johnson. Sir? Who are uh, absolutely uh, tremendous. That's that's like family. You know, okay. again, awesome. in the Army, we all are family. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. a big family over 100 million strong. Excellent, excellent. We've got another one here, another YouTube comment. We've got, I love hearing people's stories of what their plans are for military life and what it turns out to be. Sir, that's your that's your story resonated with this, this young lady here. Now, I tell you what, Tiffany, live above the level of mediocrity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for everybody that's listened, um, don't accept mediocrity. When, when we run into the hurdles of life, clear the hurdle. It's just a hurdle. Mm -hmm. Jump over it. We're athletes. It doesn't stop us. You know, when you get to the, the high bar, jump over it. You get to the wrestling match, wrestle, but, but never be defeated. You know, remain invictus, unconquered, you know, and that's the thing that you see that strength when you talk about Army medicine being Army strong, the strength that we have is that we would not be defeated. We are a team, 
we reinforce each other. But my challenge to, to each of you all, as you come in or as you serve or wherever you're at, live above the level of mediocrity and, and achieve your dreams. Excellent, excellent. So we've got just a couple more comments and we'll kind of go into the call to serve, sir. So we've got a comment here, of course, team builder. We got it again from Veranda. We appreciate your comment. We've got one from Antonio McNutt Sr. said, Lieutenant General Dingle is very motivational. Cool, we appreciate that. And we got one from Mr. Jared Bogard. He said, uh, hoping to board approval soon. Thank you, Captain Weaver. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So we've got, oh, we've got a question coming in. Sir, would you mind answering a couple of questions that will help uh, the discussion go by? All right, okay. we've got one here. We've got one from Mr. Thomas Radford. Lieutenant General Dingle, would you be willing to lecture during ground rounds in Peoria, Illinois? If so, what lecture would you like to, what would you like to lecture on? Um, I would love to. Uh, every opportunity to share my story, to lecture, um, I definitely always try to take advantage of it. Now, my team doesn't like that because, you know, we overwhelm the calendar and the schedule. However, like I tell them, this is our opportunity to serve, you know, and to touch lives. And so uh, what they can do, either for you, Otis or Holly, um, if, if he could just send you an email, my EA or my aides or team TSG, what they'll do is they'll take the request and we'll uh, work it into the calendar to make sure I support because, you know, I firmly believe that it's my responsibility to say yes to all because mm -hmm. I'm here uh, for a reason. And I'm also here to make sure that everyone out there is successful, regardless of the specialty that they are in, especially mm -hmm. if you're in Army medicine and even if you're not in Army medicine, if there's a way that we can support uh, your mission, your goal, support your students. Um, or help folks to live above the level of mediocrity to achieve their dreams, that's what we're here to do. So uh, they can reach out to you, get my team's number, and uh, we'll coordinate it, and I would love to do it. Excellent. I just want to so, quickly add on to what General Dingle just said. And, um, you know, that is just that, you know, General Dingle had told me when I went and saw um, – your briefing, sir, at Fort Leavenworth for the pre-command course. You know, I want to help you out and I want you to be successful in Army medical recruiting. You know, you were in, in the medical recruiting brigade as a former commander. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, now that we're in this new normal of virtual, you know, space and have the opportunity to do all these amazing live streams, I thought, you know, I think I'll take them up on that offer because... <laughs> First of all, you're a phenomenal person, an amazing leader, but people just love to hear what you have to say. And you really are so motivating that, you know, you do motivate others to live above the level of mediocrity. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to inspire our current service members and our future soldiers that are tuning in and mm -hmm. prospective applicants that they are going to change their life when they decide to answer the call to serve army in army in army medicine. So um, the, I can attest, I can attest to you I can attest to you being willing to help others out because you have, um, you know, answered the call to help us out in the fifth medical recruiting battalion. And we are so thankful. Do you remember how we met Holly? I sure do on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. <laughs> so Holly, Holly reached out and asked a question like I think Thomas did, um, you know, and I said, absolutely. You know, and then, mm -hmm. of course, you know, email, talk. And, you know, again, it's my responsibility to mentor, coach and teach everyone um, that that is out there that wants it. Again, my, my team, you know, gets upset with me because, I, you know, we spread us. I spread us too thin because they got to go with me. But but I think it's our job, you know. I, I think it's our job to help uh, professionals achieve their goals, you know, which is what we do in recruiting and what Holly and you and Otis are doing. But yet it's also our goal to help people achieve their dreams. And Holly reached out to me out the blue. You know, most people are scared or like, oh, wow, his schedule's too busy. And, you know, mm -hmm. they get this one chance and, you know, they're so surprised when I respond back. You know, and I caught Holly up. Holly, that's right. Hey, call me. Oh, yeah, I'm coming to Kansas. And I want you to uh, come with me to hear a briefing because it was also a test to see, you know, what her motivation level was, you know, was she real or was she Memorex on an opportunity to be better, to go higher. And she was just coming in, never been in recruiting before, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, okay, here, well, I want you to come with me 
And the venue that, that I took Holly into was uh, the, the future leaders of the United States Army which, who were selected um, by the Department of Army to command the Army's brigades, you know, and battalions and their spouses, this huge group, you know, mm -hmm. and I had Holly right down there in front with me to hear the Army medicine story to help her become a better recruiter and to be contagious and to pass it on. And so what the many recruits who know Holly, you know, that is what she's doing is living up to the charge, you know, and the mission to pass it on. Our yeah. job is to help you live your dream. Now, you got to be ready for the challenge because, you know, if you come, you, you got to step up to the plate and we're going to make you an all-star. We're going to train you. We're going to make you go higher and go faster and be the best, you know, good, better, best. Never rest till your good gets better and your best gets best. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. Uh, so, sir, I know that uh, Holly is probably going to ask some questions regarding your call to serve. So, Holly, go ahead and feel free to do that. Well, I think we've kind of, you know, we've been talking you know, about your army story and the call to serve. Um, I think that as a medical professional, you know, um, doctors, nurses, dentists, psychologists, psychiatrists, they have already answered a call to serve to be a medical professional because it takes a special person, you know, that has empathy, that's caring, compassionate to be able to care for patients. But what, um, you know, do you think is that call to serve to answer the nation's call that it's gonna take them that step further. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you just really, if, if each of us just looks back, look back over our lives and what we've been able to accomplish, you know, mm -hmm. even for those who are going through tough times, whether personal or professional, we've had opportunities in our country that are really um, incomparable or without peer. And so the opportunity first to, to be in, in our country, to be a part of our nation. Now, we're not perfect. I mean, and, and we can look around and today we, we are not perfect, but, mm -hmm. but there is no country that compares to what we do. And me with my dad, you know, who tried to instill with me to come in the military when, again, I wasn't, you know, hearing it. Um, but when I tasted it is when I understood uh, what the taste of the call to serve really meant versus dad trying to tell me. The mm -hmm. first, you got to have that special desire. The, it, it takes a very unique person to serve in the military. Um, less than 1% of our nation, you know, has answered the call. And, and there's a lack of understanding, I believe, in what we do, which makes so valuable what you all are doing as recruiters and the message that we are spreading about opportunity to serve, the opportunity to serve. And then when people take the opportunity to serve, they realize that, wow, it is a calling, a calling to make a difference, a calling not to make a difference in the lives of our teammates in the Army. That's, that's true and very important. But the difference that we are impacting in our answer and our call to serve is the impact in our nation and what the privileges and the beauties that we have in this country. And again, I'm not saying that we are perfect, but I tell you, it is a tremendous honor, a tremendous blessing to serve the nation. And what happens is that many of our, our um, society, or I call those fish ponds that who never get that recruiter to come out there or who never get a chance to hear the story, mm -hmm. just don't understand what it means to serve or have a preconceived notion on what it is to go into military service, that is wrong. You know, trust me, I was, I was the, 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 the number one person that was wrong with my preconceived notion. Live dreams, answer the call to serve and be the best that you can be. Awesome, sir. So we've got a few questions uh, and comments coming in. Let's, we're gonna break into those questions and comments and then we will kind of go into the current social situation that we've got going on in the U.S. and the Army's role that can be played within that. So let's go ahead and bring up some of the questions. The first question comes from uh, Andrea Nikodem, again, Nikodem says, says uh, how has the COVID outbreak uh, affected initial entry training and active duty training? I know in the Missouri National Guard and local reserves unit, uh, we are doing virtual drills online. 
So for the, from the initial entry training, um, as many of you all know, we, it stopped. You know, mm -hmm. we stopped it temporarily for a time for us to figure it out. And the, the complexity of figuring it out um, is what was the unique uh, thing that we had to work through. Because again, mm -hmm. we've never been through a pandemic in our lives um, of this magnitude and of this nature. And so as we stopped the IET training for us to regroup, we understood that we could not stop it for long. So we just paused it and then we had to re-implement it and keep our recruit of the bloodline of the army to continue. Mm -hmm. And so it changed because we had to implement the CDC practical guidelines um, dealing with the discipline of social and physical distancing into the training environment so that we were not bringing in uh, the virus into the training venue and in those yeah. closed cohorts having an epidemic to uh, just break out uh, within that unit or that organization. And so we had to, from the IET perspective, first get through uh, the MEP station on the screening processes. And, and what we did was really implement the CDC guidelines that were coming out. Um, and as we implemented the CDC guidelines or operationalized those from bringing it from the MEP stations into the IET locations and sites, we followed the guidelines, the 14 day um, you know, quarantine or the hold until we went forward with training. And as mm -hmm. we did that hold for 14 days to ensure that there were no virus that were undetected, asymptomatic, you know, that 14 day guideline has served us very well. And then we're doing the testing. Um, the Army also has been at the tip of the sword testing, what I did, what I have not mentioned, uh, going back to January, where um, the chief of staff, the Army, directed us to, you know, we needed to expand testing. So as we mm -hmm. expanded the capability to test, you know, that is now one of the venues that is supporting the entire Department of Defense, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, whether IET and even non-governmental en uh, entities as directed by the um, Office of Secretary of Defense to support the whole of government approach. But that testing of the IET as they were coming out of the 14 day hold before they were going into the testing site. We now have um, exported that to all of the IET locations and we're following that same process. Testing as they come in uh, 14 days and they get on, they get on with the IET testing. testing. At the different throughout the army and all compos, whether National Guard, active duty or reserves, you know, mm -hmm. we had to also implement the CDC guidelines, distancing, the leveraging of, of, of the platforms, um, you know, online to support mm -hmm. testing. And then as we're now going back to collective training, which we're now turning the engine back on all the way up to our combat maneuver training centers, whether National Training Center, uh, JRTC, um, it is going to be also nested, you know, or juxtaposed on the CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. As they get to location, you have that 14 day pause to make sure that we're not bringing the virus in, we're testing them, and then they're getting mm -hmm. all that training. Units, you know, as we implement the collective training, will continue to ensure um, that we follow the disciplines of the social physical distancing, the masking, protecting the bubbles. And that's gonna have to be a new normal that we're all working through at every post camper station in the Army. Excellent, sir. So we've got another comment here. Let's go ahead. We got it from Medical Service Corps Leader Development. Uh, when you ask Lieutenant General Dingle for help, be prepared to receive that help and then have the expectations uh, bar and stand, bar standards raised just uh, outside your comfort zone repeatedly. You cannot serve without improving. Thanks for your leadership, assistance, and contagious motivation. Well, thank you very much for the comment. We appreciate it. We've got another one. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. This looks like the, the exact same comment, but I appreciate the, the, the repetitiveness of that. Someone said, uh, it says, uh, stay fired up, sir and ma'am. Recruiting is the most rewarding assignment I've ever had. Sir, I see your head shaking. Do you agree with what's being said there? Can you tell us why you fully agree with that? You know, many people, you know, Sean, and for those recruiters that are out there, um, whether 79 Romeo before you became a recruiter or if you're a detailed uh, recruiter, uh, you know, in the Army, in the military, you know, a lot of us um, heard the horror stories about being in recruiting. Like, oh, man, it's tough. It's, it's very hard getting the numbers and all that other stuff. 
Uh, my first time in recruiting uh, was as the medical recruiting brigade commander in 2010. When I received that command, you know, after leaving Fort Bragg, North Carolina in battalion command, you know, one of my mentors said, okay, Scotty, you know, I know you didn't expect to go to recruiting. He said, but you know what, you know, you, you be the best that you can be, rock up and get over there and do your best. You know, deep down inside, you know, again, I was hoping for a different brigade. And I said, man, I can't even spell recruiting. You know, I just heard <laughs> all these horror stories about how horrible recruiting is. But then when I got into the recruiting into USAREC, I said, oh, man, this is the biggest, quietest kept secret. I think the recruiters <laughs> were spreading it in intentionally so that they can keep all the great times inside recruiting as they were going out there doing, you know, the, <laughs> the chief of staff's uh, work and task and meeting the requirements for recruiting. And so I had a phenomenal time uh, in recruiting. I couldn't spell recruiting when I took over the brigade. It took me probably three days as my staff was explaining and onboarding me. And you know, mm -hmm. if any of them listening, they remember probably about the third day I said, okay, you know what? I may not can, can put it in the recruiting words right now or lingo, but let me explain what we do in recruiting, you know, which is mm -hmm. help people you know, live their lives and achieve their goals. And this is how we do it. And I walked them through the military decision-making process and how to solve problems. In this case here is how do we do precision recruiting to get the right people in who want to join the team? And so after that, that first week, um, every day was the best day, you know, in the military for me while I was in recruiting. You know, by the time I left after two years, you know, I had, you know, understood that, you know, the 79 Romeo recruiters were, you know, y'all just cornering the market on this best job you know, field ever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I loved it. It is phenomenal. Recruiting is definitely an honor. Um, it's an honor to tell the Army story, but it's even a greater honor because what you are doing is you are helping people live their dreams, helping people to live above the level of mediocrity, helping people to achieve their goals. And when they go on this path, they become a part of a team, you know, and just one quick note on the other one, the the, the the weakest part of the chain, the weakest link, you know, has to also be the strongest link. And so when any link joins, you know, this chain, we all became we all become strong and we help that link get strong. You know, and that's what is about one team, one purpose, one fight, you know, as we serve in the United States Army. And sir, I want to you know continue with the theme of help. I heard you use that word repetitively and I want to kind of go into mental health and helping those that are dealing with um, dealing with our new norm, especially with COVID-19. And we're gonna transition into having that tough discussion, mm -hmm. uh, a needed tough discussion that, that should have been going on in our society for the long run. But as far as with mental health, sir, what are some of the suggestions that you can offer those that are having a hard time dealing with this transition into this new norm we're living in right now? Don't don't be afraid to get help. Um, year, years ago, you know, and even today, um, people mentally had a block with seeking assistance. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't do and handle problems um, by ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with asking to talk and help to get through a challenge. Because mm -hmm. the thing about life is, you're not if you're not in a storm now, your storm is coming. You know, yeah. whether it's a storm of change, you know, and as the rain comes down mentally, emotionally, a lot of times we it's cold. We want to we want to shut down, you know, and all of us go through the same challenges. You know, as we go through the same challenges, the thing is, if you need help, talk to the buddy, talk to a friend, but also do not hesitate to talk to a professional. The professional helps you to work through those. Um, some people try to internalize and just keep it to themselves, which also causes that struggle, that strain, you know, and life is not meant to, to have to us to struggle or strain through it. And that's where we cannot be afraid to seek help. We cannot be afraid to talk to that confidant, your friend, you know, your pastor, your church leader, your uh, supervisor, your trusted person who you can just talk, you know, and again, the professionals, you know, are great at what they do, and that's why they're called professionals. Seek the help. Seek the help because life is coming. I was going to go into mom and dad story, but I'll probably start crying in front of everybody. 
So I That's the best story. I yeah. can't tell you, Holly, don't you do it. Come on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we hear you, sir. And, you know, sir, to transition into the last topic of what we'd like to talk about today, and, you know, of, of course, to the viewers that's checking us out, um, United States Army leaders, military leaders as a whole, they've been having the tough discussion, the discussion regarding racism uh, throughout the military, throughout our national areas. And we wanna hear directly from the Surgeon General, you know, his points in regards to the needed discussion that's going on, his encouragement about what his thoughts are and where do you see it going from here, sir? And so first and foremost, you know, you, you see where the, the army leaders, you know, have said not in the army, you know, it's, it's unacceptable, yeah. you know, racism, um, you know, the, the lack of diversity, you know, again, are we perfect? No, we are not perfect. However, you know, we cannot be afraid to have those hard discussions as leaders. Uh, many leaders, you know, may not have never connected to have these hard discussions, which is what makes them hard because yes. we're now talking about, in many cases, the big elephant in the room that was never mm -hmm. talked about. Even though we may have had the policy written on diversity or inclusion or EO or EEO and the program is there, you know, as we've seen and what you see is a response from the nation, which says no more. You know, I think it's also an awakening because now folks are understanding what, you know, the different terms and the messages people were trying to get across. Um, racism exists. You know, my first company command, you know, when I took command, I was the first African-American uh, commander, you know, in this unit. Uh, we were in Germany. My battalion commander, you know, the first day said to me, well, you know, Scotty, I hope you don't get relieved you know, like such and such. He had just gotten rid wow. of another African-American and then here I come, you know. And so I, I, I've encountered racism, you know, throughout my career, you know, but when I hear comments like that from someone in my chain of command, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to have the discussion, you know, and I'll say, sir, you don't know, you don't know me very well and I'm gonna have to teach you and show you some things about reality, you know, and, and to me, it challenged me. You know, and so I, I would not be afraid to have discussion. I know it made him uncomfortable, but, you know, for him to throw the, the, the racist comments at me, you know, yeah. and all the times everything didn't work out in my favor. But the thing that, that I didn't do was I didn't quit. You know, I wasn't afraid to talk about it. You know, then as a leader, my thing was, OK, well, look, don't make me the leader, because when I'm the leader, I'm not going to hesitate to coach, mentor, teach and have those discussions. You know, it's, it's not going to be just a policy on paper, but it's going to be a practice that we do, you know. And so as we work through this, the thing that happens, I know a lot of people are saying that they're frustrated. You know, sometimes you can't force someone to talk, especially if they're uncomfortable with it. But yet right. you have to stand up for what is right and use the policies and the system that is there. Um, has it always worked out for me? I've, I've, I've lost a few, too, you know, when it comes to evaluations. And I called it out. But the thing is, don't quit, don't give up. You know, you make that difference and that stand. And so what you see now that is it is spreading across the Army, you know, and, and nesting with the chief of staff, you know, and the secretary of the Army and all the Army senior leaders is all of the, you're going to see senior leaders getting out to have the tough discussions that it is not all right in our ranks, that we would not tolerate this in my squad. But yet each of us, has a responsibility to stand up when we see it too. You know, we can't turn our heads away from it when we saw it, when we recognize it, you know, and the army has taken a very deliberate approach um, that is just now sweeping across every post camper station, even from the headquarters department of the army level, you know, which we have these listening groups going out to, to, to hit each location. And so we can't be afraid to confront it. Um, you know, we can't be afraid to talk about it even if it's uncomfortable, you know, well, what, what am, am I going to do? I'm going to always do what I've always done. It's not just a policy to me, but it's a practice that we implement when it comes Absolutely. to diversity and inclusion and teamwork. You know, it's not just a bumper sticker to ensure that those are being done. At the same mm -hmm. time, I encourage my commanders and leaders, hey, you, you need to have these tough discussions. And we're rolling out more um, you know, to the senior leaders to have that thing exponentially carried all the way down to the lowest level. And then for those that that know me, you know, as this travel ban lifts, you know, I, I travel and 
I will be sitting right there next to talking to Private Jones and Specialist mm -hmm. Wilson and and Captain Dingle or GS1 Scotty or the janitor Dingle to see how they're doing and that if we are including them, because I am not a respecter of the rank, the position of, of, of persons, I respect the rank, but we got to treat everyone with that equality and inclusion, which is why I like getting out traveling and talking not to the highest, but to the lowest and to all, but we all have to do this. And again, not in our army, you know, as, as you know, one senior leader just said, it is not going to be tolerated and, and it's not going to be allowed. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist though. And we got to fight to get rid of it and eliminate it and kill it. Excellent. Excellent, sir. You know, more than anything, I really appreciate your obviously genuine and real words about uh, the social issues that we've got going on, the Army's push to enlist more medical professionals in our ranks. This is just something that we really appreciate coming from the 5th Medical Recruiting Battalion. Shout out to us. Um, Captain Weaver, do you have anything you want to add, Sharon, to sir? I just, you know, want to thank you, General Dean Gold, so much for your guidance, your support, um, and your um, mentorship and feedback, you know, especially on these hard topics that, you know, aren't and haven't been discussed like they need to be discussed. Um, mm -hmm. It's important, you know, that we are seeing and hearing from our senior leaders um, mm -hmm. because it, then it, you know, allows um, people in, in my position and, and all, all the way down, um, you know, to feel that we have that support and we have that ability to talk to our soldiers, you know, to um, have that open dialogue and let them know, you know, that they matter and that we care about them and that we are not going to tolerate, um, you know, uh, racism and, and, and just having that conversation. So, you know, just we thank you for your leadership, um, you know, leading from the front because we wouldn't be able to have these hard conversations mm -hmm. if yourself and other senior leaders weren't paving the way and showing us that we need to have these conversations and we, um, you know, show us how to, you know, what the right thing is because we, we want to step up, we want to do what's right. And um, you know, seeing it at the highest level, you know, tells us that um, this is the way to go. This is the way to be. And it's not going to be in our army and not in our squad. So thank you so much, sir. Excellent. Cool. And, and I'll, you know, Otis and Holly, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this and, and to everyone that's out there. Um, if, if not you, who? You know, if not you, who? Um, is going to make a difference, you know? Each of us has a responsibility to lead, you know, whether introvert or extrovert, mm -hmm. um, if not you, who? And I challenge each of you all to make the difference. Um, it's not going to be easy. You're going to go through tough times. You know, mm -hmm. Holly, I'm so proud, you know, of you to be sitting here with the smile on your face, um, yeah. knowing the journey that you've traveled through, but yet you didn't quit. They didn't say it wasn't tough. And everybody out there that's listening, if not you, who? You're, you're going to encounter the tough times, but 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 don't quit. You know, and when you're part of the army, you know, like this army team, you know, we say that no soldiers left behind. That when mm -hmm. one goes through, we all go through. Excellent. So, Sir, so we've got two more comments. We've got two more comments to share. I'd okay. like to share with you in parting, sir. Here we go. We got one from Miss. Uh, Veranda jo Johnson said, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Toussaint and Captain Weaver. This has been a great conversation. I am motivated to join the Army. Thank you, Lieutenant General Dingle, for always pushing me to achieve at higher level of life. And Veranda, I'm you. the Surgeon General, so I can work the medical waivers. There you go. There, <laughs> there you go. And we've got one more comment coming in from our battalion. Shout out to First Sergeant Filipowski. How you doing? He says, Otis, Captain Weaver, thank you for this amazing opportunity and platform. Lieutenant General Dingle, thank you for your leadership and mentorship from afar. You are an, you are an inspiration to us officers, NCOs, and leaders across the world. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you again. This has been absolutely phenomenal. We stayed within our time. We didn't go over our time. Sir, 
if you want to come back and give us some more great conversation and just great mentorship, there's something that we really appreciate. Come on by, sir. We're always open. Sure. Thank you, Otis, for having me. Thank you, Holly. And again, the call to serve, admirable. We don't do it for the money. We don't do it for the, the notifications or the popularity or mm-hmm. or the praise. Uh, we do it because we love what we do. Excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you All so right, much, sir. sir. Thanks, sir. All right. And so in parting, I just want to say, you know, great conversation today with uh, Lieutenant General Dingle and Captain Weaver regarding Army opportunities for Army medicine career. Um, you know, some of his motivational words regarding our current uh, COVID-19, some of the things that the Army has done for the COVID-19 response, and of course, our social necessary discussions. And these are things that, you know, you've got to pay millions of dollars to receive motivation like that, and we got it for free today. So it's a heck of a thing. So I just want to say always in parting, as I always say, take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of others. Bye now.